hi everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, we are. I am so excited to have Elizabeth Span Craig uh, with us today. She is a best-selling cozy mis- mystery author of the Southern Quilting Mysteries and the Memphis Barbecue Mysteries for Peng- Penguin Random House and the Myrtle Clover series for Midnight Inc. And she's also an indie author. Uh, she blogs at elizabethspancraig.com. Uh, forward slash blog and she's also named by writers digest as one of the 101 best websites for writers and i can definitely attest to that i've learned so much <laughs> and yep. uh, elizabeth also curates links on uh twitter as at elizabeth s craig uh, and that they are later shared in the free search engine writerskb.com which, by the way, is a super helpful resource for writers. Thank you. Uh, and so uh, Elizabeth makes her home in, in Matthews, North Carolina, with her husband and her two teenage children. So thanks so much for being here today, Elizabeth. I just, I'm just so excited to be able to chat with you. Thanks so much, Lorna, for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Yes. No, this is just, uh, you know, uh, I, um, I was so excited, actually, when I, uh, you know, I've, I've been coming onto your blog even more and more just in the last, you know, probably about eight months and I've just uh, I'm amazed at how much I'm I'm uh, like digesting and then I read your I read your um, about page and it you say on there that you really kind of got your start being interested in the Hardy Boy uh, mystery series and Nancy Drew and I read those all the time I thought what in the heck we got something uh, they were the best they were the best <laughs> yeah so you know, I, this is just, I think this is just going to be so helpful for people that are, um, you know, really wanting to get started on writing like cozy mysteries. Would you share your story of uh, how you got started writing and, uh, you know, what movies or TV shows or books were your inspirations or, or other writers? Oh, absolutely. And I was one of those writers. I'm, I'm really just a one trick pony. This was my only career choice really was, was pretty much writing. I was very limited in what I could do. And I had explored journalism and, you know, of course we had recessions in between there and I did some banking, which was not fun, but ultimately I've been writing pretty much all along. And as you mentioned, it was when I was a kid, it was all about Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Trixie Belden, any mystery I could get my hands on. And I think the mystery genre in particular is really, really good at hooking kids onto mysteries. Uh, Even in the case of recently, I've kind of acknowledged what an impact (laughs) Scooby-Doo had on me (laughs) as a kid. Um, But it's true because, again, you've got, you know, your sleuth and your sidekick and just a kind of a colorful band of characters going out solving mysteries together really intriguing just kind of pulling kids in and I knew that was going to be what I had to write that's the only thing that really fascinated me really my entire life was was reading mysteries there from there it was like Nancy well, from Nancy Drew it went to Agatha Christie and then after that MC Beaton who writes the Hamish Macbeth mysteries and also Agatha Raisin and she has been a tremendous inspiration for me as well. And that it made a choice very easy for me, just saying, okay, definitely going to be traditional mysteries. And it's one of those things that you know what to expect. There is a certain pattern to mysteries. As a reader, that can be very comforting because you know sort of the pattern of what's going to happen in the story. And then each one is still uniquely different. And it makes it you know, you're, you're trying to see what spin the author has on the traditional take of mysteries and working within the structure. And I think that makes it really interesting. Maybe I think that way as a reader just because I, I'm a writer too, but it's, it's fun to see what a writer can do with what they're given and just these constraints of the genre and working inside those. Yeah. Uh, wow. I mean, I'm sure you know this genre inside and out. So I, that's really cool. Uh, I'm always learning something new. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's really great. I, I know mysteries, but cozy mysteries, I'm not exactly sure. And I think your books are mostly cozy mysteries. mysteries is that right? They are. Yeah. They are cozies. Is that similar to something like, I used to watch Murder, She Wrote. I know it's been a while since it's been on TV, but I love that series. So is that similar it's very similar, actually. I was a huge Murder, She Wrote fan. In fact, I think you and I are probably about a similar age. We may have been the only teenage Murder, She Wrote fans out there. 
<laughs> um, but I love that show. Oh my goodness, that was just a fantastic show, Angela Lansbury. Yes. And you, you know, you had an interesting cast of characters to come in, and it was a small town, a very limited kind of um, environment for suspects. And really, it was it started to be called the Cabot Cove syndrome because there was this huge body count that was racking up yes. in this tiny little town in Maine. So it was kind of funny, but fantastic uh, show and that is what a cozy mystery is is basically this you don't see a lot of sex or violence yeah. or a gore forensics um, there's no profanity to speak of and so the focus is on the puzzle of the story and it's almost an interactive process where the writer has the sleuth and the reader exposed to the same clues and red herrings and the reader has an opportunity to solve the crime alongside the sleuth. I did notice that on, like, so when I would watch Murder, She Wrote, that often the actual crime was sort of behind closed doors, I guess you could say. Like the actual, like it wasn't graphic. That's what I mean exactly. to say. Yeah. Yes, it was off stage. And yes. so you, the reader and the sleuth comes upon the body and it's not usually described in very gory terms. You know, they, you can say they were shot or they were strangled or whatever, but you don't get a lot of detail with that. And you never, it's with a thriller on the other hand, you know, you might be present during the murder actually as a reader yeah. and with the cozy mystery it's all just you know this the body has to happen obviously <laughs> to have the story to happen exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's a very safe there's never a moment really where the reader I think feels like oh this is this is really frightening or they're worried maybe there's one moment where they're worried about the sleuth stain you know the sleuth being in danger but it's quickly resolved and so not a very tense story I would say yeah no, but it makes it makes it a, uh, like just a fun read, right? Uh, yeah, it does. Yeah, they they got really popular right after nine eleven, which obviously just such a tragic time. And I think people were looking for something safe. You know, maybe they they wanted something more comforting. And usually these are set in small towns, and you just have this very closed in feeling. You've got this little idol, this idyllic setting, and then you introduce something really kind of frightening and scary and then it's resolved and tidied up at the end and it's restored pieces restored and it's really a very satisfying process and I think something that readers have really gotten to uh, appreciate just kind of that close community feeling yes oh and I, I uh, you know I love small town stories so <laughs> that actually and it, it actually really the cozy, the cozy mystery it even suits the name cozy because small town seems very cozy <laughs> So exactly. Yeah, that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. No, that's that's awesome. Uh, so uh, just to kind of dig deeper into your process, um, would you just talk about so how how do you come up with your characters? And are they are they based like are they inspired maybe on real people or by a TV show or books or something like that? Uh, Lorda, I think it's changed for me over over the years. I think starting out, it was much easier for me in developing characters to make them amalgams of people that I knew. Yeah. And that way I could just take a little bit of one person and a little bit of another and kind of make this Frankenstein of, a, <laughs> of an end product, you know. Uh, because it helped me to keep up. I was like, okay, well, I know these traits and I know this, you know, this dialogue habit, you know, that this particular person has. And they were ways to help me develop characters. Uh, but being an introvert, I only know so many people. <laughs> and also, I think I started to get more confidence in my character building for mysteries. And now it's more of almost a cause and effect process where I set up a particular event in the story and like a murder. And obviously, I have all the characters react to that that happening and, and they react in different ways uh, to make it I guess a little bit more of, of an example in the book that I had recently written I set it on a cruise ship and I had my sleuth and my sidekick on the cruise and I had this really unpleasant old woman you knew she was going to have to die and she was the victim and so I, I had set up this situation and then she did die on the cruise ship and her family was there and the way that she had treated her family made them all behave in different ways and so really it's almost like the situation dictated and the setting dictated how the characters acted and I'm a lot more comfortable doing that now than I was um, quite a few books ago that's for sure yeah 
That's so that's fascinating. So uh, it's uh, you know I guess a cruise ship would be sort of like a small town, like it's sort of a smallish community type thing. That's fun that you can just sort of change up the settings and stuff too. It was 10 books in. I was nervous about it. Um, I've done it before. I uh, did it for Penguin and Penguin wasn't excited about it. Uh, they were like, ooh, taking characters on a road trip. They don't really like that. Because <laughs> uh, you can't really, realistically, you can't take all of the characters with you, all the recurring characters. And so they said, oh, this is going to be, you know, you're limited to a few characters that you can bring along. And they're right, but it is, I mean, when you've gotten to like book 10 in a series and readers are like, oh, really, we'd like to see them do something a little different, then you start to do things like take them on the road. And it was a little tricky, but I took as many characters as I could, and then I bookended the book with um, stuff from the town. And so they were in the town, then they left, and they went on the trip, and then they returned. And I think that made it a lot easier because I could incorporate some of these other characters. So I'd kind of learned my lesson with my editor kind of fussing at me about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that is writing a little bit of experimentation and that sort of thing, right? Exactly. I think it makes it fun for the writer and for the readers because yeah. after a while, you know, yeah. I, I hate to think that I'm not getting bored with it. But I was like, oh, the readers, they, they seem like sometimes they want things, you know, kind of changed a little bit, a little bit of change anyway. Yeah. Uh, fiction writers or readers or of your books who uh, who are listening I'm sure are curious about your writing process so uh, you know do you do you get an idea first and maybe I should ask do you do you keep an ideas file <laughs> and then uh, do you outline or do you you know sort of write by the seat of your pants are you a pants or, or a plotter or <laughs> Those are always such funny. I know it's one of those things. It's like, yeah, is it panster or yeah, um, no. <laughs> outliner? I've definitely been both. So I, I cover all the bases. I think I've experimented with just about every form of writing out there just to try to figure out what works best for me. Um, yeah, I do have an idea file. But I tend to work so far ahead that I've actually got covers for my books coming out in 2017 um, because I'm just worried about getting on my cover designer's schedule. Oh, okay. Uh, these are, I have taken all of my books independent now. I've gotten my rights back, and so they're all in my own hands. And so I'm kind of in charge of getting, obviously, covers and everything done. And so it makes me feel a little bit better to have them ready. Yeah. So I know that's kind of an unusual way of, of doing things, but it works pretty well for me. So I got an idea for the next story a couple of, I guess it was probably two or three months ago, and I wrote the back cover copy for it. Again, obviously, I haven't started writing the book. I don't know who the characters are. I haven't even named the characters, actually, but that you don't have to name them in the back cover copy. It's okay. Yeah. And I have a lovely cover, even in the print format. It's ready to go. Uh, so I do keep I do keep working ahead. I do have an idea file, but I pretty much go ahead and get them covered when I get the ideas for them. Um, so that's a little bit different. Uh, I started out as a pantster, as someone who wrote completely organically and just made it up as I went along. And that worked really, really well for me until it stopped working <laughs> altogether. Okay. And, um, oh, oh, my gosh. I had this horrible, horrible thing happen where... It was a book for Penguin, and of course you're on a contract, you on a deadline. I've already been paid for the book. You know, if you don't deliver it, then you have to send your money back. Yes, because <laughs> uh, you're in violation of your contract. And I was about, I was doing great with the book. I was about two weeks um, from deadline, and I realized the book didn't work. I mean, there was such a tremendous plot hole in there. I could not figure out how to get around the plot hole. And I was on the point of just hitting delete with the file and trying to ask my editor for a contract extension, oh, wow. really flipping out. And um, and so I, I actually asked a friend of mine for some help with ideas because I was writing a little bit out of my depth. I was writing about um, a death around a beauty contestant, which I was never involved in that kind of field at all whatsoever. But she had been. She had been like a beauty contestant, growing up, done all this stuff for years and years and years. And she helped me to see there was a way through the plot hole. Ordinarily, I never do this. I never bring anybody else into the process. That time it worked really well. And then I thought, okay, I'm never, ever doing this again where I write a story organically, especially if I'm on a deadline. Because yeah. uh, it just absolutely gave me a heart attack, you know, that day that I realized <laughs> this story didn't work. <laughs> 
and I just couldn't figure out a way out of it. Um, so now I have an outline. It's not a scary outline. It's it's just if you think about a mystery, it has a specific format to it, okay. where you have um, you know you introduce your characters, you see some interaction between your suspects and your victim, and then there's a death, and then there's interviews, and then there's a second body, and then there's more interviews. There's a moment of danger for the sleuth, and then there's the reveal of who the killer is, and they're taken off to prison. Okay, yeah, pretty you know, concrete structure there to work in. And so I just sort of fill in the blanks with that. I have some really basic um, character information to start out with, and then I jump on in. But I do still have that outline after that really scary time um, back in 2010 or 11 or whatever that was. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't even think to ask what is the format of a cozy mystery, but that makes sense. And that's neat that... Um, you know, you can just sort of, I mean, I guess it makes sense because I write historical romance and there definitely is a sort of, you know, sort of fill in the, not fill in the blank, but like, it's just very, this happens and then this happens and then this happens. It does. I mean, and I think formulas get a bad rap because I, it doesn't have to be formulate, formulaic or laic um, yeah. just because it does follow a particular pattern. You can make it unique and in fact, I think that makes more of a creative challenge for the writer. How do you make this unique when you're following this particular pattern? Yeah. Um, and cozy readers definitely expect a particular pattern to be followed. And if you're not following that pattern, I mean, you're, you're going to get dinged really on the reviews. I'm mean, not going to be really happy about it, whether it's introducing a body 200 pages in or not having a body. I mean, there, there are certain things that they expect to see, and that's just part of writing in the genre. And I think most genres have that type of a pattern that, that readers do expect. And that, in a way, it makes it a lot easier. Um, I'm not sure what lit fit uh, writers do when they're trying to write fiction because obviously it's more, it's less po plot based. And yeah. I think probably have to scramble a little bit more to pull it all together. <laughs> yeah. <I> would... <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it helps, right? It, it yeah. makes the process maybe easier, right? It definitely does. It's yeah. a huge tool. It yeah. really is. Oh, that's really great. Okay. That's, uh, I'm, I'm learning more and more about closing mysteries. This is wonderful. <laughs> write a mystery. That's ultimately what I want everyone to do. Like write a mystery and I'll read it. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's awesome. Love <laughs> mysteries. It's just, uh, yeah. I think I might write a cozy thing. Now, I'm talking to you, I'm inspired. <laughs> Definitely do it. You should do it, Lauren. I'll read it. <laughs> okay, awesome. Oh, well, that'd be great. Um, you know, so, uh, since since you write uh, cozy mysteries, and for the, for the most part, I think you've stayed within a single genre. Is that right? I have. Yes, with just yeah. one little just kind of foray out into something else. But aside from that, yes, I've got like 21 cozy mysteries. Okay. Yeah. So, um. How do you, uh, here's maybe a question, you probably get asked this a lot, but how do you keep the characters and then the series interesting? Like, so what I mean by that is, is it a creative challenge as a writer to work with, uh, you know, main recurring characters in a similar setting? Or, you know, what do you, what do, you do to come up with unique story details? It's, you know, it's it's a challenge and it isn't. Uh, I think when you start with your book two in a series, it's so much easier because you've done already so much of the groundwork. You've got the setting down, you've got recurring characters, you know a lot about your protagonist, and it's very easy to take it from that point forward. I would say probably around maybe book five or so, it starts getting a little tricky. It, uh, you have to really work at it not to be stale. And I think also you have to work harder to make sure that the details in the stories are consistent. And that's really tough because you could just drop something really, really minor in and then you forget about it. It's, it's really easy to do and when you're writing and then later on it becomes a mistake in a, in a next you know, a release. Uh, for instance, and this is kind of terrible, and I'm getting dinged on this all the time now, and I'm like, wow, my readers have amazing memories. I, I need to find out what their secret is. Um, I do keep a series Bible now, but the one thing I should have put in it was one of my characters, and it wasn't one of my main characters, but it's a recurring uh, character that she had a cat allergy. 
And then I promptly forgot that she had a cat allergy, and I gave her a cat in a, in a you know, like two books later, she okay. ended up with this cat. And the reader's like, oh, no, no, she can't have a cat because Irma has a cat allergy. And I'm going, you are so right. Irma does have a cat allergy. So then I had to go back in, and that's just the wonder now of just digital technology is that you can go back into a file and just correct all the stuff that you, that you screwed up. But... Yeah. You know, ultimately, it would be better not to have a mistake like that and have this character with a cat allergy that has a cat later on. Uh, so you keep a series Bible, and in that Bible, I've got things like character eye color, preferences, uh, what type of, if they're retired, what kind of work they did before they retired. Things, anything that I mention, especially those, those throwaway statements. Yeah like the cat allergy thing where I don't think I'm ever going to revisit that again. I need definitely to put that in the series Bible and just keep reviewing that as I write that series. Well, that's, it that's helps. that is really good. So uh, just out of curiosity, that just sort of triggered a question. But so do you, I don't know, do you use like pages or word or do you use like Evernote? What do you use to, and then, and, and do you, do you put headings in there? Like, you, so characters, setting, hmm. Like, how do you, how do you manage a series Bible? I'm interested because I'm kind of writing series stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's, um, I make it as basic as I can. So I do have all the recurring settings and what they look like. And that does, again, it saves a lot of work for us if we refer to it before we start the next book. And then I have each recurring character and I have just a little section, you know, their names in bold and just a long list of, you know, it's kind of rambling non sequiturs on what they look like and, you know, their disposition and what makes them happy and what makes them angry. Um, and just all of these little things like that. Uh, and they really, that really helps. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I track. Um, I do, because I was traditionally published before, I do have a style sheet uh, with the way I spell particular things or just, just to be consistent with the style that I use in a, yeah. in a document. Um, just, I mean, even to, I'm trying to think some of the very particular things that you can kind of differ on, but I guess just some of the word use that I use and just diction of referring to things, I keep track of that as well. So that way everything is, is just mostly consistent in the stories yes. and, um, what I abbreviate, how I abbreviate it, that kind of thing. Very smart. I hadn't actually thought of, because uh, I mean that's you know, and those are those details are important. But you know, um, usually I just think of the regular details, like what's the character like, and but I hadn't actually thought of you know if you use abbreviations and all that. So I might have to go back through. My- <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of it either if, if they hadn't started me on that. But it's just like AM and PM, for instance. Do you yeah. do AM with the dots in it? Are the yeah. AM and PM capitalized? Yeah. Or are they not? Uh, interesting things like that. Just little, just little things that you do to make it consistent. Because sometimes I've found um, readers are binge reading. If you have a long um, series, and I do have a lot of books, and they'll just read one right after the other after the other. And of course, I didn't write them that way. I mean, rarely did I write them back to back. In fact, never did I write them back to back. So there might have been, you know, a year, 18 months between when I was writing those books, because I wrote three different series. So I had to go do the different books in the different series. And so I was like, oh my goodness, that's, it's true because if you're reading it back to back, then you see all these little, you know, just inconsistencies and things and things like that. Um, so I actually have some super readers who I, I'll send them a manuscript before I let it go out live and just say, what do you think? Yeah. And one lady has read, I mean, she is my number one fan. I mean, she is in Peru and she has read my book. She says 30 to 40 times a peach. I cannot even imagine because I have only read them maybe twice wow. myself. Awesome. And when I so I'm, she's the one that I send them to um, yeah. and say, you know, is there anything, have I screwed anything up? Because I feel like she knows my characters better than I do, for sure. Um, no question about it. Uh, and just, you know, let her look at it. Because I was getting all these kind of bad reviews from her. And I thought, let me get her on my side. <laughs> let me let her look at this stuff before I publish it. Yeah. Um, you know, I want her to catch the mistakes and then I can, you know, I can correct them before yeah. I, I send it out there. And that makes me sound kind of careless. But it's, I, I think, you know, modern writing and you're juggling so much stuff. Yes. With, um, oh. you know, you've got promo and, you know, you're blogging and, 
Um, you're trying to keep on top of the Amazon keywords and what they're doing, and then you've got you know you're writing books and you're making appearances. And I think I think it's possible to make mistakes, and it's definitely possible for me to trying not to, but it's it's hard. Oh yeah, well especially when you're juggling so much, right? Exactly. And, uh, that's wow. But I mean, uh, very. That's a that is really great that uh, you know you decided that you would just you know, contact her and ask her to sort of preview the book before it's actually out there. What a great idea. I've got several of those folks now and they're just, they're huge helps to me. I just, I don't think I could do it without them because even my freelance editor, of course, and she does a fantastic job. She's got a million other projects yes. as well. And she's like me. I mean, she's read my books, you know, a couple of times a piece. Yes. Um, and so we just, I mean, even though I came up with the characters, I feel like sometimes I still have limited familiarity with with what they do because I'm not reading. Maybe I should. That's a lesson to me. I should uh, be consistently going back and kind of rereading the stuff that I've already written. But it's painful to do that. You know, we all hate to read stuff that we've written before. Oh my goodness! I'd rather face a firing squad usually than read my own books. It's just I don't feel oh. the same way. <laughs> It's just, it makes me feel so self-conscious. I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, and my books are audio books, too. And so I'll be listening to them. And I'm trying to focus on the narrator, you know, and, and edit it, make sure everything sounds good. And I'm like, oh, no, it sounds just fine. I just can't, I can't handle hearing my own words. It's so bad. Oh, my goodness. We're, writers are so neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is true. We have a lot of, you know doubt about stuff and <laughs> our own writing and yeah <laughs> yes we do <laughs> uh, no that's that's so those are really great tips that's uh that's really helpful um so i yeah a series bible i'll have to remember that <laughs> i'll it have works. to re-listen this is what i do i'll re-listen to your tips because this is super helpful uh oh. you know so, so for 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 writers that are listening uh who would also love to hear about your writing process? Would would you um, uh, give your, you know, you t you, t you did talk about some of your tips on how to develop a cozy mystery, but you know, maybe there are uh, some techniques you use for, say, for instance, your main sort of detective-like character, uh, and how how does she go about interrogating, asking questions of possible suspects, and and, and how do you? How do you uh, get setting and character traits as a foreshadowing? Because mystery, right? It's a lot yes. about foreshadowing. So, um, how do you how do you use that for to let the reader know what's coming next? These are just I'm curious about these things. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's it's all good. It's and it's fun. Uh, it takes I guess a little bit of time to kind of get used to. Um, it helps that reader expectations are that your sleuth is going to jump in and participate. It definitely, definitely helps that you have that. But the readers still want to see your sleuth do things that make sense. In other words, when you're writing a cozy mystery, the sleuth is a gifted amateur. It's not going to be a cop at all. That's something else I should have mentioned. It's always an amateur sleuth. So finding ways to make your sleuth believably investigate a crime because all of us are ordinary yeah. citizens here and I don't step out of my house and just get involved with murder investigations ever. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't dream of doing that and would definitely avoid doing that actually at all costs. Uh, but you have a sleuth who the reader is expecting to get involved, but they need some good reasons to do so. So you've got, you need to have, maybe the victim is somebody that they cared about or maybe they found the body and they feel like a personal sense of kind of ownership to the case. However it is, you know, you need to have that believable aspect at least addressed briefly in the beginning, even though readers are gung-ho and they're all on board and they know your sleuth's going to go out there and investigate. Uh, they do want it to be somewhat believable and realistic. Yeah. Uh, and so then you, you've got your sleuth, you need to have a sidekick so the sleuth doesn't spend all the time in her head going, I wonder who the killer is, you yeah. know, which obviously kind of gets boring uh, for readers fast. So you have a sidekick who's not too overwhelming or overbearing yeah. for her to chat with, you know, yeah. and kind of bounce ideas off of. And then you need to get... You need to get your suspects for uh, out there for the sleuth to talk to. And this is a little bit tricky because there again, you've got an ordinary citizen who is not a police presence 
going around and talking to people about, you know, did they kill somebody, yeah. which yeah. might seem a little bit nosy. In fact, you know, usually your sleuth does end up in a dangerous moment later on in the book as a result of her nosiness. Uh, but to do that, frequently you use a series hook. And that's why I've got a quilting mystery series and I've got the Memphis barbecue mystery series. So you have got a uh, way to kind of bring these characters into a setting where the sleuth can very subtly start questioning them. So you've got a quilt shop in, in the case of the quilting mysteries. You've got quilt guilds where characters meet. You've got quilt shows. So you've got really a method to sort of casually have the sleuth investigate crime. I'd say that's probably one of the trickier aspects of, um, of writing a, a cozy mystery. Um, one of my my series, the Myrtle Clover series, does not have a hook at all. She's just the nosy old lady, and she she's an octogenarian sleuth, and she just goes all through town just doing whatever she wants to, and nobody can stop her. Uh, she's just sort of an unstoppable force. And I think at this point, everybody's been like, "That's just the way Myrtle is." You know, she just goes and knocks on people's doors <laughs> and asks them if they committed murder, and that's just that's just who she is. Uh, but it, it is kind of tricky to, to set it up at the, at the very beginning. And you've got, you're right, you've got foreshadowing to think about. Usually you've got a victim who's acting rather unpleasant, but not always. Yeah. You know, sometimes you've got a victim who's nice. Yeah. And then you have to find out, well, who would want to kill this wonderful Sunday school teacher? Yeah. How, how could this person have been murdered, you know? Yeah. But uh, there again, you've got, you've got the setup. The readers are expecting a body. Penguin liked to have a body in the first 50 pages. They were like, the body's got to happen, right, in, you know, in, this, in this time period. Um, so they were kind of pushy about it. Oh, okay. Um, but the only thing about having the body too early is then you, you don't really have that time where you can see, have suspects interact with the victim beforehand. And then you've got to figure out, you would have to figure out who your suspects are. It's so much easier for the sleuth to kind of witness the, the future suspects and the future victim interacting in some way. And that way you've got it all kind of set up so she knows who the suspects are. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that part is kind of tricky. That's probably the some of the hardest stuff about writing a cozy. I'd say other than that, it's pretty easy to write. Yeah. Yeah, so there is a, there is a bit of detail to think about, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Just to keep it sort of, I mean, they're not going to be realistic. These are not realistic stories, but somewhat in the realm of believability that a reader will accept. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Uh, and that's, you know, that's important. So they don't throw the book across the room. That's they're right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that to happen. That's bad. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm sure it doesn't happen to you. Uh, oh, never. No. <laughs> I have, oh. Yeah, I have definitely some reviews out there. They're like, what on earth? And then I was like, oh, that must have been that free book promotion I ran. And this is definitely not a cozy mystery reader. Whenever I read some review, like, what has gone on with this book? I'm like, oh, they don't read cozies. Yeah, yeah. No, you'd have to, exactly. You'd have to, you know, be a fan of the genre, right? As a reader. Yeah. It's all awesome. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's awesome. Though. So there must be a lot of conversations then between characters, like between the sort of the amateur sleuth and the the regular characters that are around her. Is that true? Like there must be a lot of conversations or a lot of dialogue, yeah. uh, very, very dialogue heavy books, um, very little narrative in there to kind of hook it together. Yeah. And probably for this genre, the more dialogue, the better because you need to get everybody talking and it's helpful yeah. um, to kind of, to have it move along a little bit. If each of the suspects, lies about something and tells the truth about something. And then the sleuth has to figure out which is which. And it, it just kind of keeps the story going because it sends the reader and the sleuth off in, re you know, obviously wrong directions. Yeah. Those are red herrings. And it also provides clues. And that's probably a favorite way for cozy mystery writers to drop in clues because otherwise, you know, you don't have any forensic stuff going on in a cozy mystery. You know, you're not following the, the DNA. You're not doing anything with ballistics to speak of. So you're really limited to what characters are saying about each other and their relationship with the victim and maybe catching them in some inconsistent stories, um, alibis messed up, um, that kind of thing. 
Um, and then you have these clues that come out in dialogue, and because mystery readers are so incredibly savvy, and they're, I really think they're the savviest readers out there because they're looking to solve the case. They are just dying to solve the case. Yeah. But they also want to get it wrong, so they're surprised. So they want to solve it and feel like they're solving it, and then they want a surprise ending. So it's kind of hard to deliver all of that. Uh, but you deliver a clue, and then you distract from it. So whether that's with another body or maybe a couple of other uh, suspects or yeah. characters are arguing with each other or whatever it is, or maybe something happens that seems like a more important clue, it's sort of a sleight of hand. So you've got to have the clues out there and be very, very fair with the readers. And then you also have to distract from them as well so that the reader hasn't solved the case in, like, Chapter 2, which would be really, really bad. Yeah. That, you know, it takes a lot of thinking as a writer to become up with a surprise ending, right? It does. Uh, and sometimes, and I'm actually frequently surprised by the ending myself, because if you have set up the story like you need to, where every suspect has motive, means, and opportunity, then you can change the killer at the very end. And probably nine times out of ten, I do that. I'll be like, you know what? The person I thought was the killer is not the strongest candidate. I, I think readers will be more surprised if it's this person. And then I'll just change it right there at the end. And you would think that would make a mess for the first draft, but it really doesn't because you've got everything set up perfectly. It just points to different people. And then at the end, you, you say, okay, this is this is the one with the real clues where, where this, this, and this, and the others were red herrings. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Actually, as as you were describing that, I was thinking, well, that's actually the part I liked about Murder She Wrote. It was yeah. usually a surprise who actually yeah. was the who done it at the end, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I, I know my editor had a lot of thoughts about that too. Or she would sometimes ask me to change the killer because she'll be like, "Oh no, the readers will want it to be this person because they don't like that character." So you know, let's make it somebody really nice, and then they'll be surprised. You know, so sometimes <laughs> I'll I'll remember that advice and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, let's let's change it to a nicer character," and then they'll be shocked. And they'll be shocked in the end. It makes oh. it fun. How fun. You get to play around in your imagination. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I always feel like sort of like Mr. Rogers, you know, neighborhood of make-believe or whatever. I'm like, I live in the neighborhood of make-believe just all day long. Well, yeah. That, and that's the fun part of writing, right? Just, it just, is. That's the best part. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of listeners are actually, you know, first-time writers uh, or, or struggling writers who are, you know, just starting to write their first novel. And, uh, you know, are there some tips that you would have for first time writers who are just starting to starting their process now? I, I do have some tips and those are <clears throat> really just to keep the bar set very, very low. And I know that is counterintuitive and not really what a lot of people say, but I think it's more important to set up a string of successes in meeting your goal than it is to rack up this huge word count. Um, I feel like, you know, if you can just every day say, if, if, even if it's just, you know, opening up your Word document and looking at your manuscript, even if you don't get any farther than that, just thinking about it, just even five minutes a day, just set it as low as you possibly can and think, okay, how much can I feasibly do each day? Because we all think, you know, oh, well, we can, you know, be like NaNoWriMo yeah. every day. Yeah. <laughs> You know, life happens. I mean, I've, you know, my daughter has had all kinds of dental appointments this week and, you know, my cats have been running amok and just yeah. life happens. Yeah. Life happens in between. Uh, so I think to set it really, really low and I've had it, you know, usually my goal is three pages a day, which I mean is nothing compared to so many, so many writers out there. Um, I can knock that out in about 20 minutes. I am pretty fast, um, but I have been doing it a little while, but I know when I had a, um, a toddler and it was just super, super hard. And this was back 2002 ish. I would, you know, I would say, okay, she will watch Sesame street, El Elmo's world for like 10 minutes tops. And that's, and that's it. And in that amount of time, that's what I, when I would write. Yeah. And I found that in that amount of time at that time I could write about a page, but you know, even if you do a page a day, then you have got too long of a book actually by the end of the year, something you're going to really need to edit back. So I think just setting the bar really, really low, being very flexible with yourself and just saying, okay, maybe I can do just a few minutes on my lunch break or maybe I can get up before everyone else in my house. 
Uh, maybe I can write at the, uh, I have a doctor's appointment, maybe I can write in the 10 minutes before I'm called back there. You know, just being really flexible about writing in public in particular. I write every day in a carpool line outside my daughter's yeah. high school. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I honk the horn by accident because I've got the laptop, you know, <laughs> between the steering wheel. <laughs> and I'm just typing away and sometimes it just honks. It's pretty bad, but... Um, she doesn't know I'm embarrassing her because she's inside the high school. So oh, okay. <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that makes it okay. But just be really flexible with yourself and understanding that, you know, we are all just so busy. And it's not saying writing is not your priority, but just being really realistic about it. And then if you've done your five minutes, your 15 minutes, and you're still wanting to go, you know, keep going, keep writing, and just, you know, really get some um, progress made. But then the next day, just because you did a lot of progress the day before, just pretend all that progress didn't happen and still go back to your five minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it is and just maintain that habit and consistency. And that's not to say, you know, obviously if you're sick one day or, you know, there's some sort of family emergency that you, that you have to write. I'm, I'm not one of those people and there's certainly days that I don't write. But just hopping right back on and, and just not letting that affect you and say, you know, every day is a new day. It's yeah. a fresh start. And forgetting what happened the day before, just let that go. Or even the, the last month, if you're really off track, and just say, but tomorrow is a new day and just starting right back over again. You're not behind. You don't have to catch up. Never feel like you have to catch up. Just, just do that day's work. And I think that's probably best for keeping going. If you can feel a little success... Yes. You know, in whatever exactly. you're working on, because it's yeah. too, it's too, um, <laughs> it's too discouraging if you're going day after day after day and not seeing where you're feeling like it's success, right? Right. And I mean, that's for everything, right? I mean, I certainly have had those New Year's resolutions where I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym every day. No, I'm not going to go to the gym every day. Let me set it for once a week going to the gym. If I do more than that, that's great. But, you know, let me at least go once a week to the gym and, and set it really, really low again. Because otherwise, I mean, you know, I can't eat healthy every day. There's things I just know I am not going to be able to do. And it's so much better just to make it really, really, you know, small, a, yeah. a really small goal. Yeah. Yeah. Now that is really, that's really helpful. Um, so what, what would you say to writers who are uh, struggling maybe to find the time to write or who are, you know, maybe they're plagued with self-doubt, which is, I know, totally normal, yes. uh, you know, about writing their book or, uh, or maybe they're thinking, you know, they have this idea for a book, but they're just really worried that it'll never reach the, you know, readers, uh, that there'll be an interest in it. What, what would you, what would you say to them? I, that, and that's a tough question. I would say know why you're writing your book. Yeah. And I think that there are ways to be satisfied with your writing no matter what. Uh, maybe you're just writing for yourself. And I know that when I first started writing, and this is in the early 90s, I was definitely writing for myself. And I didn't particularly even want to share what I was writing. And it just gave me a sense of satisfaction to write. I would say if you're writing for commercial success, not to say write, you know, don't write the book of your heart because I think that's also important, but that may be a project that helps to satisfy you creatively, and it may not be a commercial project. Okay. Um, and I, this always makes me feel bad to say, but if, if, you, if you want success, I probably would write in a genre that has specific um, qualifications to it in terms of structure, it has built-in reader set. They're readers who read every mystery that comes out, every romance that comes out that they can get their hands on that month. They're super readers. Yeah. There are people like that out there. You'll have a built-in audience if you if you go in that direction and you follow that norms. Those norms and if you're willing to kind of sacrifice a little bit of, you know, your own thinking outside the box creativity and keep that for maybe other projects for yourself. And just keep within the constraints of the genre and the expectations. And to me, that's also a creative challenge. It may not seem so. It may seem like you're really restricting yourself. But to work within those constraints and to make it an exciting story, to me, is a satisfying, a creative challenge. 
Uh, that's probably the best thing to do and just keep writing stories and write some for yourself and write some to share and that way you know it, it works out. I, I know I wrote one book that I just had to write it and I didn't really even want to write the book. It was a zombie book. I don't write zombie books. I don't read zombie books. I'm scared of zombies. I'm just one of those chicken writers and readers and you know if I see Walking Dead I'm turning the channel. But the story just would not leave me alone. I, it was an attack book. I got attacked by it. And I did put it out there under a slightly modified name so my cozy mystery readers wouldn't be just absolutely terrified. Um, but I didn't expect it to be a commercial success. It's doing okay, but I don't do a lot with it. I just needed to write it. And so I think we all have stories like that we need to write, but um, just to understand the market and the commercial aspect of it, probably to do a little bit of research and just you know, pretend like you're writing for you know a business and saying okay they want you to write this and then just write that yeah that might be the best yeah and there is ways that you can satisfy your you know creativity if you just want to write a book and you don't necessarily have to um you know publish it you can just write it for yourself right Exactly. Or publish it and, you know, just not not pin everything on it. It's yeah. just, you know, and we're all, we can be also really kind of sensitive about our work and um, you can still get that satisfaction, but you can, you know, you can get success too if you're willing to kind of um, do it in a particular way. I yeah. think it just, um, just accepting that that's part of it. And in some ways it's kind of a relief going, oh, I don't have to have this unbelievable concept that nobody's ever thought of before. No, not really. You could just really do the same kind of thing and making it slightly different and yeah. really be a success at it. And that helps too. Uh, you know, you have you know, written for years and you, I, I've been, I've been, I've read a couple of your books already and I just love them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes. So, you know, what, what, what would be your best piece of, you know, writing advice that you've been given that has really helped you, inspired you, motivated you or, or whatever? Uh, that's also a tough one because I think I, there were several things that I had gotten. I think probably from a motivational standpoint, it was definitely just to start each day fresh and not try to catch up, which is yes. just bewildering. I mean, I've even as a somebody who has um, kept a diary for years, feeling like, oh, I have to like backlog on my diary the weeks that I didn't have an entry or something like that. It was just exhausting to think. I've just got to write five pages to sum up what happened in two or three months. No, it's just today. Let me just talk about today. And the same with the story. You know, wake up. It's just you're just focusing on that day's goal and that's it. Um, and then I would say also probably the best piece of writing advice I got professionally was to self-publish. Um, and I do have, I guess, 10 or 11 books that are traditionally published, but I did get my rights back to all the uh, characters. And I started self-publishing from that point on. And I think that uh, certainly financially speaking, and probably just because I enjoy having a little bit more control over the process, that's worked out extremely well. That's not to say don't explore traditional publishing, but it's getting real tough out there right now yeah. um, with with these publishers. And they're, the publishers are cutting back quite a bit. Nothing to do with us or the market per se. It's mostly that the way that readers are reading has changed and um, they're not changing as quickly. And so I think self-publishing probably, or strongly considering self-publishing is, is probably a very good piece of advice as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's great. I love, I love self-publishing. It's just, <laughs> it's so, I mean, I know there's more work, you know, with do, managing everything, but um, uh, I don't know, I, I, love, I like that control and the, it feels like you have a little more freedom I guess. Definitely, definitely do. And I don't know if I have, I mean, definitely there, I guess, okay, there's definitely more work with self-pub, but I did a lot of work with trad pub, or I felt pushed into doing things with trad pub that I didn't want to do. And so I think maybe the things that I did for trad pub that my publisher was pushing for me to do was maybe that made me more stressed out. And, yeah. you know, I'm electing to do things with self-publishing instead of being forced into doing something like a book tour or something like that, where that's not really, that's not me <clears throat> going out and meeting people in bookstores and signing books. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> not. Definitely not me. <laughs> but as a self-published author, you have the opportunity to meet readers in a lot of different ways. And it's yeah. just, it's great to be able to do that, you know, on, you can do it on Twitter or Pinterest or, you know, through podcasts like this one. Absolutely. Lots of ways. Yeah. yeah. 
you know, Elizabeth, I just feel like you just shared so <laughs> many wonderful tips and just, you know, your process on writing a cozy mystery. I think it's just going to help a lot of uh, people who are wanting to write cozy mysteries. Would, would you uh, share uh, what new books or projects you have on the go right now? And then maybe you, uh, if, if you can just tell, tell us where you uh, readers or writers can find you and your books online. Absolutely. Uh, right now, I have got two different projects that I'm working on. Fall to Pieces, which is one of the Southern Quilting Mysteries, and then Cooking is Murder, uh, which is a Myrtle Clover. I love that title. <laughs> it's, yeah, we're going to have fun with that one because Myrtle is a terrible cook and thinks she's a great cook. So <laughs> I see that hilarity will ensue, I have a feeling, um, with that one. Uh, and those, I'm being a little cagey about the release dates on those, but uh, sometime in 2017. So I've, I'm being a little slower and a little bit more deliberate with these these two books. I usually write about three books a year, and I'm slowing down just a tiny little bit right now. Yeah. Um, and sort of slow and steady, and yeah. um, see when those come out in 2017. And uh, you can also find me on my website, which is elizabethspancraig.com, and there are links to my books on all platforms and retailers there. Awesome. Well, Elizabeth, this has been such a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And uh, thanks so much for just you know sharing all your thoughts on writing cozy mysteries, and then your advice for writers. It's been super helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorna. I appreciate it. And thanks for all you do for writers, too, and being such a great resource.